All right, well, good uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where in the country you are. Uh, so I am Tyler Hall. I'm the president of the Canadian University Survey Consortium. I'm also uh, here at Carleton University. And I'm just going to be giving you a little bit of a walkthrough today uh, on the CUSP registration process and also give you a chance to ask any questions that you might have uh, in terms of how registration works, how the survey works, and just try and hopefully set you at ease and give you some uh, tips and tricks to be able to do this as painlessly as possible for your institution. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes in terms of the webinar before we begin. Um, so uh, you can mute yourself or uh, join the chat at any time if you have a question or raise your hand. Um, there's a little uh, bar that should appear. I believe if you hover your mouse over the bottom of the monitor, um, there should be a little panel that pops up that gives you some options there. Um, either to, to participate in the chat or to mute yourself or to stop your video or start your video or whatever one of those things that you would like to do. Uh, and again, uh, we're a fairly small group here today, so if I'm, I'm going too quickly or you have questions that are relevant to the section that I'm working on, uh, please jump in and ask questions. Uh, we want to make this uh, as easy for you as possible. Um, I should also mention that if at any point you get a little lost or you or you feel like you've got it under control today and then you go to register and have more questions, by all means, get in touch with us. We'd love to just be able to help you out in the registration process. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna do a little bit of a walkthrough in terms of uh, how you might go about registering and as well what the different options are and some of the uh, different things that you can choose to, to do in terms of the registration. Um, so hopefully everyone can see the screen I've got shared here. Um, this is just uh, the CUSC website, so it's cusc-ccreu.ca. Uh, and that's the easiest place to go and start because uh, that's the place that has all the information that you're going to need to be able to, to determine what you want to do in terms of your registration. Uh, so here's our, our website. And at the very top, you can see that it says, uh, registration is open for the 2019 survey of first year students. Um, so that's hopefully why you were all here today because you're interested in learning about that. Uh, so we'll click on the taking part here to just get some more information. And here's just a little bit of an overview about uh, who we are as CUSC uh, and why you may want to participate. And then at the bottom, there is uh, a link here uh, that takes you to the registration page. And if you're a French institution or you're a French uh, language speaker and you want to do that in French, if you're on the French version of our website, uh, which you can toggle up here in the top right. It will take you to the, the French uh, version as well of the registration page. I won't be speaking French today because uh, I respect you all too much to force you through that because my French is abysmal. So if you were to click on this register link, it will take you to the registration page, which looks something like this. Um, now, the registration is designed to be done all at once. Uh, but you can pause for as long as you want and leave it open and it, come back to it. Uh, but if you do close it, uh, the only thing is you'd need to start uh, from the beginning. Uh, again, you can choose your language here at the top between French and English. Uh, the other thing that's really handy that we have here is a link to the procedures manual. And the procedures manual and the registration page are designed to work in tandem. Um, in order to not have too much information on the registration page, uh, a lot of the stuff is in the procedures manual, so it's often handy to have them both open at the same time. Uh, I've already just opened it here in a different tab, and you can see, and it, it's it's fairly long because it wants to be, we want to be very comprehensive to make sure that it answers as many questions as possible for you in terms of registration. Uh, so don't be put off by the length, it's just trying to be uh, very complete uh, and very descriptive to just make it as easy as possible for you. Um, but if at any point you're confused about what some of the options are, a, a great first place is the procedures manual. And then again, by all means, if you still have questions beyond that, uh, please do get in touch with us. We do want to make this as easy for you as possible. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a, a quick walkthrough uh, by going through the registration page and showing you what some of the options are and hopefully giving you a little explanation of things. Uh, and again, as we go, if you have questions, please just jump in and, and ask. Uh, so the first page is, is fairly straightforward. It's just your uh, department. Uh, information and your institutional information. Uh, this is just so we can identify which institution you come from. So we're just going to skip that for now. Uh, the second page is your institutional contacts. We, we give space for two contacts. Um, and we would ask that if possible that you do give the contacts. 
Uh, one thing here that we should uh, keep in mind is that these contacts are contacts for survey administration. Um, so these are not just general communication contacts. They're people that we would get in contact with to resolve issues relating to the survey administration. Um, so put people who are going to be most intimately involved with the survey itself uh, and don't necessarily put, you know, whoever is responsible for this at your institution in terms of higher ups, whether it be the provost or a VP of some kind. Uh, put the person who's actually dealing with the survey issues on a day-to-day -day basis in these contacts uh, because those are the types of things that we'll be contacting you about. Uh, and again, just all we need is just a name, an email, and a phone number with extension if possible just to get in touch with you in case any issues arise as we go. Um, I'll also actually just note at the very bottom here there's a, an email link so again just to highlight if you do have questions ever as you're going uh, you can just click that link and send us an email and we'd be glad to get in touch with you and just uh, give you some assistance there. All right, so we'll move on to the next page. Um, so it's going to take us through now uh, a bunch of different options in different ways to participate. Uh, the first option is whether we're registering here for the survey, which for this year will be the 2019 survey of first year students, um, or if we're only here to purchase a membership. So some people just um, purchase memberships some year and participate in the surveys other year. Uh, so whether if you're here to participate in the survey, then you click this, this first link. Uh, which will give you options for memberships in a subsequent page. Uh, but this is just to allow people who want to maintain their membership with, uh, with CUSC to do so by doing this registration form here. So for us, we're going to select participation in the 2019 survey of first year students and then click next to get to the next set of options. Um, so the first question is about membership. Uh, for those who haven't participated or don't know much about CUSC, um, CUSC is a member-driven organization. We're a not-for-profit, uh, and any uh, Canadian institution with degree-granting authority uh, can apply to become a member of CUSC and as long as they pay the annual membership fee and sign uh, what we call the Data Licensing and Membership Agreement. The Data Licensing and Membership Agreement is uh, a document that binds all of us members together uh, to ensure that we uh, work confidentially with the data that we get because one of the things is is we are the Canadian University Survey Consortium, so we're a consortium, which means that we share data with each other. So if you participate as a member um, and pay the membership fee and sign the data licensing and membership agreement, you will get access not only to your own data, but you will get access to all uh, the data from uh, other participating member institutions. Now, the things that aren't included are any specific uh, identifiers that an institution may choose to put in or any of the special variables that are in their sample file. Um, as well, we don't uh, pass on from your institution to other institutions any uh, open-ended comments or open-ended answers to questions. Uh, so you don't have to worry that any sort of sensitive information might be passed on. It's just the answers to the scale and multiple choice questions that gets passed on. Uh, and we do that to allow institutions to have a good way to be able to do unique analysis with their data sets. And I, I think this is one of the things that's really great about CUSC and, and provides a lot of value to you as an institution. So if this is something that you're interested in, uh, I think that it's a, a great spend of $500 to be able to participate as a member uh, to get that, um, that complete data set. Uh, I will say if you've not participated before and don't have a data licensing and membership agreement, that that's probably something that you wanna start fairly early in the process. Uh, it's not required for you to participate in the survey. It would be required, however, for you to have that signed data licensing and membership agreement with us in order to get the master data set, which includes data from all participating members. So you wouldn't be eligible to receive that until we had a signed data licensing and membership agreement. Some institutions uh, need to go through uh, their legal counsel and it may take some time. So if this is something that you're interested in, I'd recommend getting in touch. We can get you a copy of the data licensing and membership agreement and get that process started for you as well. If you are choosing to participate as a non-member or do not meet the requirements of membership, so you are not a degree granting institution, uh, you can also choose to participate as a non-member and that option is available for you there. Okay. Then we'll get into the survey information. So uh, the first question is, uh, what is the total number of students at your institution who meet the definition of a standard sample? 
and it does reference, and we try and reference every time throughout the sign up form here, the registration form, any time that there is uh, an item that you may not be familiar with and that is referenced in our procedures menu. So if we go to our procedures menu, you can see I've already got it open here to the correct page. And it gives you a breakdown of what the standard sample. And the standard sample, again, if you're if you're looking at it and you're registering now, we're in the fall 2018 semester. It does, the first line says that it's students who are enrolled in the winter 2019 semester. So obviously you don't have the complete information yet. Uh, but if you look here, it says, please indicate if the answer above is an actual count or an estimate. An estimate is absolutely fine. Um, the reason we collect this information is that so that when we produce the master data file and we produce our reports, we can weight our data appropriately by institution. Uh, and we would do weight that by institution size uh, in terms of the number of eligible uh, participants. So if you are doing a sample of your, your population, uh, we would just need an estimate of how many people were eligible to participate in the survey so we can uh, weight your responses appropriately in the master data set. So I'll just go through very quickly what the standard sample is. So again, I mentioned it's students who are registered enrolled at your institution in the winter 2019 semester and were also enrolled in the winter 2018 semester. Uh, the reason we ask for both is that we, uh, a lot of institutions run their survey early in the winter, so the January, February timeframe. Students who started at your institution in the winter of 2019 would not really have the same experience as students who joined in the fall of 2018. As well, this is the first year student survey, so there's a number of questions about things like orientation um, and adjustment to the university. That their experience, if you join the institution in the winter 2019 term, would be very different from those who joined in the fall term. Uh, and so, for the sake of consistency, so that when we share data, we are sharing data uh, with consistent samples and consistent populations, uh, we ask that there are students who are registered in both the winter 2019 and fall 2018 terms. Uh, there's a couple other stipulations here, so we uh, ask that you include only first year undergraduate students uh, who graduated from high school or stage up within the last two years. So just trying to get a capture of those students who are direct uh, entry students. Now that may, information may not always be available to you, you might not be able to tell uh, exactly who uh, came from high school in the last two years, we understand that. The idea here is to make your best effort to get a population that matches this. Um, and with the best information that you have at your institution. We understand that institutions vary in terms of the data that they have, so it's just trying to get a, a capture on uh, what you have and do it as best you are able to. Uh, include only students enrolled in first entry programs, and those are three year, four year, and five year bachelor's programs. Uh, so these are programs that students could apply to directly from high school uh, or SEJEP. Uh, include students who have no other prior university or college experience except for within the current academic year. So we're not looking to include uh, students who come in with transfer credits or students who have been at your institution for a couple of years but are still first year students. Uh, you should include both full time and part time students as well as students who are in province, out of province, Canadian, international, uh, distance ed, as well as on campus students. And then it says here to exclude students who are in their middle years, so second and third year, students who are graduating, uh, special, undeclared, and some of your certificate, diploma, or continuing education students. Now, that said, this is what we include in the standard sample. And the standard sample is meant to be exactly that. It's meant to be standardized across all institutions so that when we as members participate, we are all putting forth the same sample and can compare our data appropriately. Uh, that said, if you want to include additional uh, students who don't meet this standard sample, uh, there is an option for that, and we'll talk about that in a moment in terms of the special sample. Uh, but that's just what's included in the standard sample, and that would be the information that we would share across institutions as members. So go back to the registration form here. So uh, the beginning information is just, uh, um, at this point, you would only probably be able to do an estimate. Uh, so I'll put in an estimate. And I'll just estimate for the moment that we have 5,000 students who meet the uh, standard sample criteria. It also asks then about the special sample. And the special sample can be any group of students that you choose that you would like to sample that don't meet the uh, definition of the standard sample. Uh, as well, beyond that, if you want to do oversampling, so if you're only going to be doing 1,000 students and you have 
for instance, in my institution, I've estimated 5,000 students, but maybe I want to oversample international students this year. Uh, because it's not a random sample then that I would be including, I would want to include that oversample that I'm doing in the special sample. So the special sample can be students who don't meet the standard definition or who are an oversample of any group that you want to include. Um, so I'll just say yes here for the moment, just so we can see the additional options that come, because I believe there's branching here. Yeah, and then we'll, the next, the follow-up question will be how many students within the special sample? And again, you may not know the exact number, an estimate here is okay. Um, we don't ask if it's an actual count or an estimate at this point because we're not gonna be weighting this data. Because again, all students that you include in your special sample will not be shared with other member institutions. We only share the member with member institutions, uh, any respondents that are from the standard sample. So those that meet the standard sample criteria to ensure that we're sharing consistent data across institutions. I'll just put in a number here for now, so it'll let me continue. Uh, so that's the information about the sample. I, I hope I didn't go through too quickly, and if anyone has questions, maybe I'll pause for a minute so you can ask questions about uh, the sample, either the standard sample or the special sample, because I want to, I realize this is a part that has quite a bit of information in it. I want to not go too fast here. So feel free to unmute yourself or pop something in the chat if you have a question. I'll just wait for a moment before continuing. Okay, not seeing anything, I'll just continue then because I know you probably are all very busy people. Um, so the next set of questions then uh, is about what you would desire for your survey launch period. Uh, so the first question is, it asks you when you would like your survey to start. It, you may not know the specific date at this point, but I recommend putting in an estimate of when you would like to go live. Uh, the reason is, is that uh, we're only able to launch so many surveys on a given day at so many different institutions. And if you want a specific day, I recommend putting it in here. It's not that you are forever bound by that, but if there are other institutions who have requested a specific day and you end up changing your mind, it's the institutions that have requested that day uh, earliest who will get uh, the ability to do that first. Um, I often put in a date and I often change my mind as well. Uh, things come up at the institution or maybe we're having difficulties drawing our sample or getting the correct number of people. Um, and we're definitely flexible in terms of doing that. Just know that if, if there's a specific date that you wanna launch, uh, definitely put that date here. And if you change your mind, you might not get the exact date that you're looking to change depending on how busy that day is in terms of how many other institutions we're launching at. Um, so for now, I'm just gonna put in the first day that we have available. And you can see the range here. You can choose to start any time between January 7th and March 22nd. Uh, the next question is, when do you want your survey to end? So you can have the option uh, of letting this go uh, fairly long and leave it open quite a while. Or if you want to have it within a very specific window, uh, you can choose to do that as well. Um, so I'm also going to just let it go the whole time period. And then we ask for the dates of your uh, winter or spring break. And the reason we do this is because we send out uh, email reminders to students who haven't yet completed the survey. And we wanna make sure that we're not sending those out during your, your winter or your spring break uh, because it's very, un, uh, very likely that you would get a very poor uptake on that. Uh, so we wanna try and avoid that window. Uh, and also try and avoid a couple of days before that window as well. We don't want to be sending it out a reminder on the Thursday or Friday before your winter break. Um, so just populating that information would be helpful to make sure that you are able to get a good response rate in terms of your survey. Um, next question is, will your institution be using incentives? Um, this is something that we do recommend that institutions uh, do include. Uh, you have the option of doing that, uh, and you have the option of choosing which incentive you would like to do. Uh, as well, you have the option of doing 
uh, different types of incentives. So I know that some institutions do early bird draws for those who complete the survey within the first two weeks. So you have lots of flexibility in what you would like to offer. Uh, but we do, rec I'm a little bit agnostic in terms of what you offer, but uh, we do know from the data and doing experiments that the inclusion of an incentive uh, is a strong motivator to students filling up the survey. So if you want a good response rate, I uh, highly recommend including an incentive uh, for your survey and making sure that it's at least worthwhile enough that you'd think someone would be willing to complete the survey. So one prize of $10 is not going to be fantastic, but perhaps a couple of prizes of a couple hundred dollars uh, would be enough to entice your students to complete the survey. Um, we also asked when you would like uh, PRA. PRA is our contractor that we hire to uh, administer the survey for us uh, and they will draw the list of respondents uh, winners for your incentives and you can specify a date if you'd like that. Um, if you have any additional requirements uh, or you're trying to do an early bird thing or maybe rolling prizes on a weekly basis, um, I would recommend getting in contact with us and making sure that we can have arrangements to do that as well. Um, next question is, in which languages would you like to receive your reports and data? Uh, we are a fully bilingual um, organization, and so you have the option to have it either in English or in French, or if you're a bilingual institution, you can choose to have it in both. So I'm going to choose English because the French would be of very little use to me. Um, and then you have the option of also choosing when you would like to be invoiced uh, for the items that you order. We know that some institutions uh, want to have it within a certain budget year, and so we have the option of doing that, and you can even choose a specific date if you'd like. Uh, the one thing I'll say about uh, invoicing is that um, going forward, if you want, uh, you, you will not receive your data and your reports until you have paid uh, the invoice for that year. So if you put it really far in the future, you just won't get your data until you've paid your invoice. So just a reminder of that. Um, so the experiment, so this is um, an optional thing that you can choose to participate in. And as CUSC, we have been doing experiments for a number of years. And the reason we run experiments is because we believe in making data informed decisions. And experiments are a good way for us to test different hypotheses, uh, hypotheses about uh, survey administration and see if they work and see if they are best practices. So as an example, in our 2017 and 2018 surveys, we ran an experiment in which some of the long lists of items uh, that we asked students to rate were randomized. And we did that with a portion of our population. So last year we had 25% uh, of the students in participating institutions uh, had their lists randomized on questions. As well, when we ask students which are the most important, three most important things uh, about your professors or various items like that, those items would be randomized as well to reduce survey priming because we suspected that the real reason some of the items were coming up were because they were at the top of the list. So by randomizing the list for students, uh, we were trying to see if that would reduce survey priming and giving a, give us better data. As a result of running that experiment, um, we did determine that this was a good practice for us to institute. Uh, we didn't want to just institute it without doing an experiment because we want to make sure that there are no uh, unforeseen complications with doing this. Uh, so we ran that experiment two years in a row with, with really good and encouraging results. And so now we've implemented that as a, a continuing practice for all survey participants. So um, this is something you can choose to participate in. Uh, you don't have to if this is something that does not appeal to you. Uh, but we do like it if institutions participate because it does help us choose whether or not we want to institute these, if these are good practices for us. So for our 2019 survey, the experiment that we're looking to run is we're going to provide students, 10% uh, of students in participating uh, institutions who choose to participate in the experiment, I should say, with a dashboard. And from that dashboard, they'll be able to pick which sections of the survey they want to complete and they can complete the survey um, at their own time, at their own leisure, and in whatever order they choose to do. We're interested to seeing if this uh, improves response rates or completion rates of surveys, um, and if this is something that encourages students to participate this, in the survey a little bit more. Uh, so we're only including 10% of students in participating institutions, uh, and there's no cost to doing this, but if it's something that is entirely up to you and your institution, if this is something you'd like to participate in. 
If you do participate, we also include a flag in your data file that indicates to you that uh, a student was included in the experiment. So if there are complications with it or if they give different data in any way, you can be able to look at that and see that for your own institution specifically. And then finally, there's on this page, there's a question about your institutional email address uh, and if there's any requirements that we have. So whether you need uh, to know the IP addresses of the, of the mailing servers or if there's any information that you need to be able to work with your IT department to make sure that the emails that get sent to students don't get uh, blocked by spam filters. Um, we do recommend you working with your IT department uh, to make sure that that requirement is met because if your emails all go to the spam filter, it's, you're going to get an absolutely terrible response rate. So um, if there's any requirements that you have or any information that you need, uh, just you can indicate it here by taking it in and just let us know and uh, we'll follow up with you to make sure that you get the information you need to be able to run it uh, smoothly. So moving on to the next page then, the next option is about uh, which survey package you would like. Uh, the, this depends uh, entirely on the number of students you want to sample, not the number of students uh, who meet your standard sample criteria, but the number of students you actually want to sample. Um, typically, in the past, most institutions uh, have done sample surveys of 1,000 students, um, but more and more we're seeing institutions who are choosing to do full censuses of their uh, eligible survey population. Uh, at Carleton here, uh, we like to do a census of our students. Uh, it allows us to break it down by different academic units uh, and really drill down to the data more carefully. So for my institution, I would probably select 5,000 to 7,000 students, which would probably fit uh, a, full a full census population rather than doing a sample. But again, the sample size you choose is entirely up to you. Uh, next options are you can choose to have additional email reminders. Uh, so there, um, there is an initial invitation email plus two reminders. So there are three invitations in total that come with the standard uh, survey package. Uh, but you can choose to add up to two additional emails with, for a total of five emails um, if, you, you, if that is something that is of interest to you. Um, they are at a cost of $150 per email reminder. So I am not going to choose any of those today. Uh, and then additional questions. Uh, you can choose to include additional questions uh, in your survey. Uh, the one thing to note is that you can choose to include them uh, throughout the survey, but they come at the end of a section. So you can't just intermingle them in different, uh, some of the large matrix questions. Uh, you can't choose to add options to some of the drop down menus and things like that. They have to be unique questions. And the reason for that is that we need to make sure that since we're doing data sharing as a consortium, that students who participate in these questions all have the same questions across uh, the entire consortium. Um, if you add additional questions, the data from your questions does not get shared. It's for your institution only. Now, if you're choosing to participate um, in the survey as a, a collaboration group, which is something I haven't talked about, but we will in a moment, um, I know that some collaboration groups might include questions as a collaboration group themselves. Um, this is not about this. This is about if your institution is asking questions for your institution only. Um, so this is about institution specific questions, not necessarily a group of institutions getting together and asking the same questions. Um, in terms of your uh, participation with asking additional questions, we do ask um, that we have a copy of the questions at least four weeks prior. Uh, one of the reasons is we want to make sure that the questions that get asked um, meet with the, the mission and values of CUSC as an organization and that they are questions that we deem to be appropriate. Um, so just anything that would deal with, with any of the content within the survey. Um, and as well, that gives us time to make sure that they're programmed properly and that you have a chance to review both the design and look of the questions uh, in your survey. When we send you a confirmation of your registration, if you've indicated that you'll be asking additional questions, uh, we'll indicate the date that we would like you to send them by. And that date is based on the date that you indicated you would like your survey to launch. Um, so again, just four weeks prior, and then there's the email there. It's uh, our admin uh, CUSC email that we would like you to send it to. Okay. So I've mentioned uh, collaboration group. 
Uh, a collaboration group is any group of institutions that want to get together. Um, and there is a minimum size of, I believe, four institutions that you would need um, to participate in a collaboration group. And a collaboration group then can have common questions amongst themselves. And you can also get a report that compares you specifically to your collaboration group. I do know that this year that there are two collaboration groups that uh, are have formed. And so we'll just indicate yes here. Um, but again, th this is something that you would have to arrange uh, yourself or someone else would have to have arranged um, for you. So if you are participating in a collaboration group, um, we ask which one you are doing. The two that we know of, again, there's the Alberta collaboration group. So that's all uh, post-secondary institutions in Alberta or the Maritime uh, group, which is the MPHEC collaboration group. Or again, if you are creating your own collaboration group with a set of institutions, all the institutions obviously have to agree to it, um, but you can create your own here and then specify which institutions are collaborating. If you select one of these pre-existing collaboration groups that you specified here, you don't have to indicate uh, which institutions are participating. Uh, we'll use the information from the institutions that select those options to, to figure that out. Um, but if you are creating your own, we just need to know who's participating with you. And then we'll follow up with all institutions to make sure that you're all on the same page in that regard. And again, if you're including additional questions as part of a collaboration group rather than um, rather than just as an institution, we'll leave those questions as well. Uh, see a question in the chat as well for the Alberta collaboration group. Is that the mandatory? Is that mandatory for Alberta institutions? Uh, maybe Glenn, you're the best one to answer that as a, a member of the Alberta consortium here. Oh, there he goes. Yes, it is mandatory. There we go from Glenn. So if you're an Alberta institution, you'll, you'll need to select that option then. All right, and then this is the final screen of the registration here in terms of the options that you have. Uh, and these are different things that you can uh, choose to include. So you can have a comparison report a comparison report will break down your responses uh, compared to uh, a peer set of your choosing. Uh, there is a minimum size of the peer set. Um, I believe it again, it's, it's four institutions. And the information of this is outlined in, in the procedures manual in section 11.7 there for you. You can get an executive report, which is uh, a written report, which is a high level summary of, of information uh, that you might be able to just take straight away and, and give to a member of your executive team of someone who wants to know at a high level at a glance uh, how you how you did in your CUSC survey this year. Uh, as well, you can have your uh, responses to open-ended questions categorized. Um, how that chooses to be categorized, you can work with uh, PRA, the contractor who does the survey and the analysis to, to set that out. And the cost is 65 cents for each uh, completed open-ended question uh, that there is. So that's something that you can choose to do if you have a lot of survey responses and you know you're not going to have time to be able to go through the open-ended comments, but you would like to have some sort of sense of, of what the content is in there. You can choose to have uh, our contractor go through and categorize them for you and give you a summary. Um, in terms of the reports, all the reports that we uh, sent to you are electronic copies. If you would like uh, a paper copy, um, you can order it below. Obviously, if, if you select a paper copy here of a report that you haven't ordered, we'll follow up with you to just clarify whether you actually want that report or not. Um, so if, you, if I don't select a comparison report here, but um, I select the comparison report here, We'll just follow up with you because we want to make sure that you actually order, know what you're ordering and, and getting that. Um, so you need to actually order it above to get it. And this will get you an electronic copy. And this option here is for a paper copy of the electronic uh, reports that we are already generating for you. Uh, the master report is available to all uh, institutions. We put it on our website as well. Um, and I'll just show you that very briefly. This is something that is is a public document that we put out every year. Um, so on our website here, you can download a copy of the 2018 Graduating Student Survey Report. Uh, and that 
goes through and it does at a very high level a breakdown of the results for all the questions within the survey and breaks it down by the three groups of institutions. We break uh, all our data down into three groups. So group one institutions are small, primarily undergraduate focused institutions. Group two tend to be more uh, mid-sized, comprehensive institutions. Um, and then group three is the largest institutions typically uh, focused on medical or doctoral schools as well. So we break it down by that way in the reports as well. Uh, so that's what the master report is. Um, so every institution, regardless of whether you choose to add it here or not, does get a copy of the master report. This again is just for a paper copy. The institution long report is uh, a version of the master report that includes all of your data for your institution alongside. So you can quickly at a glance uh, have an, a document that would compare exactly what you did as an institution to groups one, two, and three, and overall for the entire cost population. Uh, comparison report and collaboration report I've talked about a little bit before. And again, this is just for um, ordering paper copies. Uh, question in the chat there. I think that's a question that maybe you can answer, Glenn, as well, on the Alberta side. So the question was, just for those who didn't see, it's um, does each Alberta institution have to pay for the comparison and executive reports? So those are the options F4 and F5 here. Um, and the answer would be that um, those are beyond what the Alberta government is paying for, so they would be at the cost of the institution. So that's probably something that's only relevant to you as a, an Alberta institution. Um, in terms of, and there's a question here, do we receive these reports electronically as part of the survey? The default survey package includes um, three reports. It includes the master report, it includes the institution long report, and the institution short report. So the institution long report is a mirror image of the master report that includes all of your institutional data and highlights specific things at your institution. Uh, and that does by default come with the survey package. And then the short report is uh, a two-page report um, we're currently working on redesigning that to make it a little bit more graphical uh, with a little bit of kind of an infographic. So something that you could just very quickly uh, put out or distribute uh, to people at your institution to give you a high level idea of what um, what the institution looks like for your survey results at a glance uh, with a quick comparison to your comparator group uh, and the Canadian institutions as well. And so all three of those by default are included as electronic reports as part of participation in the survey. So yes, they are, uh, those three reports are included by default. The comparison report, the executive report, and the collaboration report are additional optional things that you can choose to order. So those are not included by default. Those are things that you would have to, to, to order separately. So those are, those are above and beyond the standard package. So the standard package includes the three ones and the, uh, everything else is beyond that. Um, and you can have paper, yeah, you can absolutely order paper copies after the survey is complete as well. You, you could change your mind on a lot of these options um, for quite a while. Obviously, once things get started to work on, it's a little bit late to change your mind there. Um, so you can't just cancel your executive report uh, come, you know, June. Uh, but if you want to add things in, by all means, you can add those late in the game. You don't need to decide now. Um, so if you are, are on the fence about something, but you really want to lock in your date for launching the survey, Go ahead and register, don't select that option, and you can certainly add options in terms of comparison reports, executive reports, or paper copies of your reports at a much later date. And so those are things you, you don't have to decide now, but if you're on the fence, I would say don't include them at the moment and include them later on um, so that if you forget, you don't accidentally get billed for something that you weren't sure that you really wanted anyways. Um, even after afterwards, um, on the paper copies of the reports, you can order those quite late if you would like. Um, even after you've had a copy of your electronic, you can go our paper one if you would want it. Okay. So two more options here. So uh, starting this year, uh, we've given institutions the option to uh, get individual survey links tied to individual student surveys and be able to include those links either in your learning management system, your student portal, 
um, or whatever system you have to, that students can log in. And um, I, I know that there are a wide range of learning management systems and student portals out there. Uh, so this is something that you'd be responsible as an institution on your own to figure out the implementation of. Um, but if this is something that your institution is capable of doing and you would like to include, then for $150, you can purchase that set of links and include um, those links within your learning management system as a, an additional way to try and reach uh, your survey participants. And finally, there's an optional reduction. So those, so some institutions may not want uh, the two special institution specific reports that come with the survey package. You can choose to remove those if you'd like. So you can choose to remove the institution long report and you can choose to remove the institution short report and that will just save you a little bit of money. So those things by default come in the survey participation package. Those are in the base price, but if those are things you don't want, you can choose to remove them to save your institution some money if you so desire. This isn't removing the paper copies. This is removing um, them entirely. So you wouldn't even receive an electronic copy of either of these reports if you selected these here. And then finally, if you have any additional comments, uh, questions, concerns that you want to just include as part of your registration or any special requirements you, that you have, uh, you can include that here. Um, and then there's a, a notice about withdrawal. Um, so up until two weeks before your scheduled start date, there shouldn't be an issue with which withdrawing. Um, if you choose to withdraw from participation in the survey after that two week point, uh, there may be a cost depending on the amount of work that's been done to prepare for your institution's launch date. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, if you're unsure if you're gonna participate, uh, let us know at least two weeks in advance to make sure that there's no cost to you in that. And then finally, um, you're registered. And once you're registered, what we will try and do is we'll try and uh, at least once a week, usually by Friday, um, send a copy of the confirmation of your registration. This will indicate all the options that you selected on your registration form and as well give you an idea of what the total cost will be. Now, this is just an estimate. These things may change over time. You may choose to add or change things after that point. By all means, we're happy to do that. Um, but this is just a way of trying to make sure that you know that what you've ordered and what the total cost will be for you. So we'll send that to you starting uh, hopefully this week uh, for those institutions who are registering at the moment and uh, then you'll have an idea from there where to go. We'll also indicate at that time uh, when we would like your institution specific questions to make sure that there's sufficient time to review them and program them into your specific institution survey as well. So that's a quick overview of our, our registration process. Um, the procedures manual, as I mentioned, uh, has a very fulsome explanation of all the, the requirements that are in there. It also gives you uh, on uh, pages seven and eight a, a good timeline for things to be thinking about. So um, I would recommend reviewing this even before you begin your registration to just make sure that you check all the boxes in terms of what you need to do. So for instance, the very first thing, if your institution is an institution that requires ethics reviews for all surveys, I would recommend getting this started as quickly as possible uh, as that's something that can take a uh, significant amount of time depending on the complexities of, of your ethics application and ethics board requirements. Uh, and as well, if your institution is new and participating as a member for the first time, um, you'll need to look into the data licensing and membership agreement. And so uh, we indicate here that we would like that completed before June 1st. Um, but we recommend getting that start process started quickly uh, to make sure that uh, you can have that in time to get that. Uh, registration closes on December 14th. Um, now that is a soft close date. Um, we do allow registration to go beyond that, um, but it is at, um, the, at our ability. So it's not guaranteed beyond December 14th. We do try and accommodate as much as possible, uh, but we'll, we'll get in contact with you. So we'll leave the forum open for a little bit beyond that, um, but we do recommend trying to get it in before December 14th to make sure that you have the ability to launch at the time that you want to, to do that. So just seeing a, a couple of questions in the chat here. So uh, for incentive, uh, we identify yes or no and the date to have the respondents drawn. Uh, how many do you, uh, good question. How do you indicate how many to draw and if there's early incentive as well? Um, I would recommend putting that in the final box. That was that last box there. If you have specific requirements about your incentives, 
in terms of how many to draw, um, usually that information should be, or that information should be included within your invitation letter. And so we'll pull that information from your invitation letter so that we know exactly how many to draw for you. Um, but if you have uh, additional requirements beyond just a specific date and a specific number that you want to do, or if you're trying to do something a little bit different, uh, please just let us know. You can choose to do that by sending us an email at our admin at cusccru.ca account or by including it in that final box in the registration form would be the easiest place to include that. So I'm not sure if there's any other questions now for you here today. Uh, is there an option for a student to opt out? Uh, yes. Uh, so by default, if you, uh, yeah, so once they've been sent the survey. So once a student has been sent the survey, there is an option at the bottom of the email for procedures for them to opt out um, so that they can choose to no longer be reminded to participate in the survey if they so desire. So that is certainly something that's included as part of the invitation letter to all students, yes. Will we be able to get a copy of our opt-out list? You know, I'm not entirely sure on that one. I'll have to double check to make sure that's something that's possible, but I can certainly get back to you on that. I don't, I don't know offhand and don't want to promise something if it's not possible, but I believe it is. Yeah. Any other questions here today that I can help with? Uh, not seeing any, so thank you all very much. Oh, sorry, there is one now. Uh, don't worry, don't apologize for asking questions. Uh, is it possible to not have any in the standard sample? Um, yes, I, I don't necessarily know why you would do that. If it, the standard sample, um, I, I, let me just think this through. So it's, it's, sorry, it's possible that you just don't have any that meet the standard sample um, because it does specify degree granting. So if you have students that um, none of your students are in degree programs, then they might not be included in the standard sample. So you can put zero in that box and include them all in the stand, uh, special sample. Um, that is certainly something that you can choose to do. Yeah, yeah, De yeah definitely college problems. We have, um, I mean, this survey was originally designed for universities. We're very happy to have colleges doing it, and we're, we're trying to adjust as we go here for you. Um, but yes, um, one thing I would say is that just include them in your base when you choose to uh, indicate how many people will be participating. So that was the option when you would choose, you know, between 0 and 500, 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000, et cetera. Uh, just make sure to include both your special sample students and your standard sample. Even if your standard sample is zero, include the students in the special sample in there as well. And just as a reminder, if as you're going, you have more questions, please get in contact with us. We're super happy to help you with anything. Uh, we wanna make this as easy for you as possible and just get in touch with us and we'll be happy to do that for you. Uh, so I'll hang around uh, and answer any more questions for a little bit, but if you wanna go and and you have other things to do by all means, but uh, thanks so much for joining and I'll just stick around for a little bit and answer questions here. Yeah, so good, good question here about the data licensing and membership agreement. Uh, you don't necessarily have to sign a new one if you participated many years ago. Uh, the data licensing and membership agreement has not changed in the past 10 years, so your old one is still valid. You can choose if you would like to sign a new one, but it's not a requirement. Uh, but I do strongly recommend that you review it and remember what your obligations are as a member. Uh, because typically, well, as, as institutions go on, uh, the people who sign those agreements have left and forgotten. So we can send you a copy of your signed one if you would like. Uh, but at the very least, we just ask that you review it and remember what your obligations are as a member is all. So the short answer is no, you don't have to, but you can certainly do that if you would like. Absolutely, I'll send that to you. Uh, maybe 
this is a question for you, Glenn, for invoicing, since we're part of the Alberta Collaboration Group, will this be taken care of? Yeah, I, maybe I'll do this by voice because that's faster than typing right at the moment. Um, Alberta is paying for all the standard costs of participation. So if you choose some of those things that add cost to uh, the, the uh, participation at the end, you're on the hook for those. So if you add a question as an institution, that's yours. If you choose to get the uh, list of, of links for putting into your portal for learning management, you would pay for that. But uh, all other items, including the membership fee, uh, the province is gonna pay for and gonna, is gonna do that directly with CUSC rather than piecemealing it out by each little institution uh, invoice. So they don't want to have that many invoices to process. So we're doing it all at once in March, I believe. So then as an institution, you would only receive an invoice for the additional items that you participated in. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, the province is doing uh, an incentive and you certainly can add your own incentive. Uh, at King's, we're definitely doing uh, an incentive program because it makes a significant difference in our participation rate. Uh, at King's, we do two $250 gift cards for Amazon. Um, we have previously done more tech-related things, but uh, too many students already have an iPad, so you can't give that away anymore. Uh, and we found that broadening it out by making it Amazon actually made it more appealing. Uh, we have also used tuition discounting because uh, it, that has appealed to some students. The timing of that for CUSC is a little rough because you have to carry it through a budget year. Uh, so we've tended to go back just to gift cards. Yeah, and I'll just check in with my institutional perspective. So at Carleton, we do three prizes of $300. Um, is what we typically have done in terms of our incentives. Uh, we do a census typically when we do our first year in graduating student surveys, so we end up with populations around 5,000 students. Uh, and we've, we have found those to be fairly sufficient. Um, but again, we've tried a lot of different things. We've tried more prizes of smaller amounts, uh, working within our budget. It doesn't seem to matter that much. It seems that but three prizes of $300 works about as good as anything for us. And it's much easier to administer than a lot of small prizes. So um, that's just what our perspective is. I, I can't speak for how it will work at your institution, but uh, that's certainly something that's worked for us. Uh, can we access the 2019 survey instrument? Absolutely. Um, just send us an email. Actually, we can follow up with you as well and send that to you. Uh, we don't put that publicly on our, it's not publicly available on our website at this time, uh, but we can certainly send that to you. So I'm not seeing any final questions come in, but again, just a reminder, if you leave here today and you get partway through your registration and get stuck or have questions as you go, just send us an email or get in contact. We're, we're always happy to, to assist you in any way we can. And just wanna thank you so much for, for joining us today. And we, we look forward to your institutions participating with us in CUSC this year. So thanks very much everyone and hope you have a great day.